Whoa. Whoa, yeah. Hi. Dog is here. Are you just gonna do that right there? No, you can't do that right there. Go, go. Go with your slimy ball chomping. Clap, 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 clap. Hello, my name is Jeremy, this is Red Means Recording, and I am a tiny person in a big frame because today I'm gonna to talk to you about my studio and how I record my videos. This was a request from a Patreon uh, post that I had posted asking people to uh, give me video ideas because sometimes I don't have any. So that's what we're doing today. Uh, I'm gonna to talk to you about the sort of like four stations that I have and uh, how I record them, both from a video perspective and also from an audio perspective. I've broken this video up into little chunks that are hopefully more digestible for what you're interested in learning about, so make sure that you check the, uh, you know, the little table of contents thing and skip to where you want to learn more about stuff, all right? Cool. Before we get too far into this, I want to say that I'm going to be talking about a lot of really expensive, relatively um, uh, audio and video gear, and I want you to know that if you want to shoot videos of your synth stuff for yourself, you don't need to go this far. My recommendation for getting started shooting your own synth videos is use your phone. It's probably the uh, best 4K camera you have if you don't have something else. And um, use uh, something like the Zoom H6. This is a relatively inexpensive digital recorder that has four XLR slash TRS inputs, and it comes with this cool little microphone on top, which means you can sync your recordings to your phone by doing a clap at the beginning, because your phone is going to record the room audio, and this will record the room audio as well. So you plug your synths into the line inputs, you have this record as well. When you hit record, you do a clap like this and you'll have a clap track on audio from that and also from your phone and you'll be able to sync them. There's really no excuse for just shooting stuff with your phone camera audio. Uh, it's unprofessional and I would recommend if you want anyone to take your video seriously that you get some good clean audio and uh, record with something like this. So get your phone, set things like exposure and focus to locked and then use this. Use, use something like this. It's, it's not that bad. There's a link in the description, you know? That's my recommendation for that. So uh, let's talk about video first. The camera that you see filming me right now is a Sony a7 III. There it is, see, woo! It is a full frame mirrorless camera and it's hooked up to a Ninja 5 recording device, which uh, is a hard disk recorder. That is responsible for uh, recording in ProRes and also sending HDMI out to things like my streaming device. So this is what you see when I'm recording anything on a tabletop that's facing down. There's that tabletop. We'll get into more of that later. That goes into a laptop. Hey, look, it's a laptop. Isn't that amazing? And there's an audio interface as well. Ooh, wow, look at that audio interface. Isn't that sweet? So we'll talk more about the audio recording over there in a bit. The camera that I'm holding right here and flailing around is a Panasonic GH5S. Uh, I purchased this last year um, with the 12 to 60 uh, kit lens. It's a really good lens actually. And I use this around the studio to film everything that's not the tabletop. Uh, this is my roaming camera and it's been a really, really good addition to the studio. For recording my voice, I have two AT2030 microphones on these boom arms here. Boom arm. This is a condenser microphone that needs phantom power. It's relatively inexpensive, and I found that it makes my voice sound really, really good, um, at least, you know, in my opinion. So I have two of these. I have one here, and I have one here, and I have two boom arms, depending on what I'm doing in my studio. Each recording station that I have here has its own audio interface that I've collected over time, and then I use the Zoom H6 if I need to do something that's not uh, immediately connected to something here, and uh, that seems to work really, really well. When I shoot, I shoot uh, flat, which means that the uh, image coming off of this is really, really flat and uh, doesn't really like have much color or saturation or sharpness or contrast. Um, and that's because I really like to color grade and I'll show you that in my post-production bit uh, in, a, in a smidge. Um, so you'll be able to see what the image looks like before and what the image looks like after. Let's talk about lighting. Um, I do not like to light. I am bad at it in terms of getting nice, uh, real, good uh, natural light. I don't have a lot of room in here for soft boxes, so I depend heavily on natural light. Uh, you can see there's a big window behind my uh, my main station over here, and I depend on that natural light to, uh, to light that for the most part. At nighttime, I use these cheap panels from, um, from Amazon. Uh, I don't remember who makes them. There's a link in the description. But these are cool because they are RGB, and I have two of them. You can see my ooh, mood lighting. So what I can do is I can actually change the color of these uh, independently, um, which I will show you right now. Now I'm blue. Dabu dee, dabu die. Um, I can be teal. I can be any color. I can also do this. Ooh, 
yeah, lighting. So I use those in uh, blue and red mode to uh, get the sort of mood lighting that I have around. And they've been a really fantastic addition to the studio because they're small, uh, they don't heat up because they're LED. And uh, in general, um, I get some pretty cool mood lighting, which is nice. So now that we've covered sort of the optical aspect of this, let's talk about the audio chain. And we're gonna start with the work table station over here. Chop, 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 chop. So let's talk about this area over here real quick. What's going on with my IO? Uh, there's a laptop on a cool little swivel thing here. This is fun. Um, and it's hooked up to this audio uh, fuse studio from Arturia, which has eight inputs. You can see my microphone inputs right here. It has two phone outputs, um, so I can listen to what's going on. I have, on one of the phone uh, outputs, I have a Korg tuner. And this Korg tuner um, allows me to easily tune anything that's passing through the uh, the you know, headphone out, which could be anything. So I'm able to tune my oscillators using this if I don't have a tuner built into the rack. So this just sits here as part of the, uh, the audio interface setup and I can use it when I need to, which is great. So generally I have all the cables plugged into this and I just uh, hook them into what I need to hook them into. In the back, um, there are two stereo pairs that are my primary IO um, and I have those connected to TRS cables and uh, a, TRS to eighth inch for things like the OP-1. A lot of people ask about my cables. These are GLS or seismic audio cables, the uh, the colored TRS cables. Um, they're cheap on Amazon and um, I've bought so many of them. They are really, really great. Link in description. My main Eurorack cables are Hosa for the most part, though I do have these really cool glow in the dark mod bang cables as well. The other IO box that we have here is a uh, Blackmagic ATEM Mini. It is a HDMI video switcher that takes incoming signals and turns them into something that like OBS can uh, deal with. So I have an uh, HDMI output coming from my Ninja 5, which is the hard disk recorder I mentioned earlier. And it goes into the ATEM and I'm able to pull a clean, uh, really wonderful signal from my Sony directly into, um, into OBS. So that's how I'm able to stream on this station. Okay, so let's talk about audio recording itself. Most of the time I only have like one or two pieces of gear that have line outputs that are going into the audio fuse. So it's really easy for me to just grab the taps that I have coming off the back of that, which are stereo pairs and plug them into what I'm working on. And uh, Bob's your uncle. But for a modular rig like this, things get a bit more complicated. Not that much more complicated, but a bit more. So I'm a big uh, fan of submixes in my modular um, experience. I like to be able to record stems and then manipulate them from a mixing or arranging perspective in Ableton afterwards. So all of my racks, um, you know, deal with that in some way or another. For instance, this rack, and I'll put a link to the, um, what do you call it, the modular grid and some notes about this rack specifically in the description, has a stereo out right here in this Unify mixer. It has a stereo out that I'm using here for the uh, effects aid at 100% wet, treating it as an effects send. And I have a little submixer here for my drums. So how do I get this stuff into here, right? Because these are tiny little cables and, uh, the other thing that you may not know is that your rack level is hotter than line level. So the answer to that has been these things. This is a little like pigtail adapter thing. On this side, we have 3.5 millimeter um, or eighth inch, the same size as a Eurorack cable. Look, they're friends, look at that. And on this side, we have a female TRS connector or probably not TRS, probably tip a ring, uh, because I don't think this is balanced, but that's okay. So I take this side and I plug it into the uh, mixer or Eurorack thing that I want to take out. And then the side goes into a, uh, a TRS cable that goes into my audio interface. I pretty much only use balanced cables unless I'm playing guitar. So if you're worrying about whether or not you should buy TRS or TS cables, just get TRS. Um, it's better to have those than not. And um, if I'm wrong, I'm sure someone will tell me in the comments. Um, the thing you have to realize though, again, is that your rack levels are much hotter than line levels. So um, while something like the Unify mixer has a line out and will play nicely with something like the audio fuse, no problem, something like pulling directly out of the dope for A138S or A138N or directly out of the effects aid, you're gonna get a much hotter signal. And I have to use um, what's called a pad, which is a built-in feature on many audio interfaces to pad the input about, I think it's like 20 dB. And then I don't have any issues. I don't have any um, uh, loudness issues. It goes in fine. I'm able to record directly from here. 
The same can be said when using our friend here, the Zoom that I mentioned earlier. This can accept levels just fine. So don't worry about uh, this. Everything that I've, I've been using in uh, this video so far has worked well with your Rack stuff. So um, if that's your concern, then uh, you know, you'll be fine. So I mentioned I'm using a Ninja 5. I record ProRes to that, and I record in the native codec on the uh, GH5 because it's fantastic. The GH5 actually, I think, has better IQ or image quality than the Sony does for video. Uh, it was kind of made for it, so it kind of makes sense that that'd be the case. So I hit record on um, one or two cameras, depending on how many I'm using. I hit record in either Audition, which is my main multi-track recorder for this kind of stuff, or Ableton. I do a quick chop, 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 which we can use to synchronize later, and I go. If I need to do another take, um, I just keep rolling, keep going. And then um, if I need to stop and start, I uh, repeat that process with another chop, 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 and uh, we're good to go. So with that out of the way, let's go and talk about uh, the other station. Hi friends, here's the other station. I'm going to zoom in and make this a little bit better from a framing perspective, but I want you to see the whole thing so you get a sense of where we're at with uh, everything. This is a custom piece of furniture that was made by a really awesome patron of mine um, that houses all the stuff here. We have the main modular rig that you've probably seen in some videos. We have a uh, Mackie 1202 VLZ, which takes a feed from this, and we'll talk about that in a bit more. Um, this is an IKEA tabletop sitting on top of a big wire rack that has a bunch of stuff underneath it. Signals come from here and either go into the Mackie or go into this Mix Pre 10. Uh, it's an eight channel audio interface that can record either on its own or act as an audio interface. I said audio interface twice. That's going into an old MacBook and I usually record straight into Ableton here in multi-track. So let's break down how that is working. So I already talked about the concept of submixing in your uh, Eurorack and pulling stems off um, via taps to record in stems and why I think that's important. So let's talk about where those tap points are on this rack. I'm using the exact same methodology I did before in that I have those little turnaround things and uh, they're going into TRS cables that go into a variety of places. The first tap is over on that pan mix right there by Happy Nerding. It's a six channel mixer and it has panning. So it's a really, really great end of stage mixer for anyone in the Eurorack world. And I heartily recommend it. It's great. It has a line out left and right, you can see. So I don't even have to worry about your rack levels at that point. It is just at the level that uh, it needs to be to go straight into the Mackie. So that's kind of my dry mixer. I take dry signals, things like bases and stuff that isn't being processed with effects. And it goes into there and then it goes into the Mackie where um, I was originally using the Mackie when I had a much smaller system. And the reason is because this mixer, which I would also recommend if you're looking for a hardware mixer, they are cheap, they are built like a tank, and they have pretty low noise. This mixer has aux sends. And what an aux send is, is the ability to take any channel that's going into it and send it off to an effects processor. In this case, that effects processor is the Zoya. The Zoya was an integral part of my recording process when I first started doing Eurorack stuff and did all my effects. So I was able to plug things directly into the Mackie and send them off to the Zoya to get like, you know, reverb and delay and stuff like that. So dry signals go into there, they go into the Mackie, they might get a little bit of effects, which I know is a little strange to put on uh, dry stuff, but sometimes that's just how it works. And then the uh, output of this goes straight into the Mix Pre 10 as one of the stereo stems. The next stem that I'm pulling off the rack is from that little 3X stereo mixer over on the right, also from Happy Nerding. It also is a six channel mixer, but it's meant to be used with stereo pairs, which is really great for stereo effects. So this row in my Euro rack is for stereo effects. Right now, the Rainmaker, the Z5000, and the Monsoon are doing that stuff for me. And I have those, all three, going into the stereo mixer there. So that goes out directly into the next pre, and I have my effect channel. So I can use those as sends, or I can use those as inserts, depending on how I want to do my thing. But basically, I know that those signals are going to be more diffused and wet and uh, maybe reverby or delayed. So um, they're easier to mix together than something that's supposed to be dry and punchy like a bass or something like that. The final stereo stem that's coming off this is the uh, drum stem. So I have two things that kind of can do drum duties. I have the VPM EQD and the Rample. The Rample goes into a little submixer to uh, pan and change the volume of each channel. And then the output of that either goes into an effect or usually with the VPME goes into this uh, Hyrolo stereo mixer right here. This is another six channel stereo mixer and um, it accepts uh, mono or stereo 
um, but I'm using it in stereo. And there's a tap right here that goes out to another stem on the mix pre. So drums get their own stem because percussive material likes to be mixed together. Um, I'm trying to make stems that work best together when I have to mix them as a, as a, a group. Uh, people that love to count may have noticed that that's only six, and you are correct, six channels. So what are the other channels doing, the last two? Well, usually uh, the Perform VE was going in there. So a lot of my modular stuff had vocals in it, and I was running a microphone directly into this and singing along, um, and a stereo thing came out of this. Lately, I have been actually using the uh, extra channels as a um, sort of wildcard thing. Um, and mostly I've been using the Synstrom Deluge in that. I have a MIDI cable coming out of the Keystep Pro going right into the Deluge. Since the Keystep Pro is my master clock for all of this, when I hit play on the Keystep Pro, it starts my modular rig and also starts the Deluge. So I've been having a lot of fun uh, melding those together. And you can see that I have a, uh, a tap coming out here that goes right into the mix pre and records the Deluge as its own stem. So. Stem mixing, really, really great way to work with your Eurorack so that you can get the most bang for your buck uh, when it comes to working in your DAW later to um, edit, uh, sweeten, and uh, rearrange. It's, it's good stuff. And that's how this station works. All right, so here's where the magic happens, so to speak. Uh, this is my workstation. Um, if I got rid of everything else in the room, this would still stay, obviously. I have a Focusrite Claret as my main audio interface right now. Um, you can see that my MIDI controller there, it's the complete. I, uh, over on the left, you can see that little pre-Sonus uh, monitor station thing. Um, that takes uh, output from my Claret and it sends it to headphones, but it also sends it to my two sets of speakers, which are the Aventone Cubes, which are some lo-fi speakers I use to test mixes in a more lo-fi environment, and the uh, Atom S2Vs, which replaced my Dynaudio BM6As back in the day. I uh, really, really like them. They're really, really great speakers. The nice thing about having something like the PreSonus is I'm able to actually have like multiple sets of headphones plugged into it so I can test my mixes across like a pair of open headphones, a pair of closed cans, and um, maybe a second pair of closed cans. And primarily my uh, cans are the Audio-Technica ATH-M50X and the Bayer Dynamic um, DT770s, I think the 80 ohm version. So that's what's going on over there. That's where I edit. That's where I make most of my music. Um, that's where everything sort of comes together. And with that said, let's go ahead and talk about the post-production process. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the post-production aspect of my workflow. The first thing we got to do is ingest. And to make ingest easier and simpler for myself, I've created a project template. So you can see we have a project template here. We're going to copy this and paste it and name it what we want to name it. So this project is my video studio work flow walk through video. So in this, I have empty folders for everything that I'm going to be working in, uh, including things like graphics, exports. Premiere has a file set up, and we'll take a look at that in just a second. In fact, I'm going to copy and paste this name and put it into my Premiere thing here. So that's that. Let's go ahead and get our footage and stuff going over so I can show you the rest of the post-production workflow. So here's footage from the Sony, and here is footage from the Panasonic. So we're going to get those going. I also need to get my audio from Audition, which I recorded on the other computer and put on a little shuttle drive. Um, and that is right here. So I'm going to take this and I'm going to put it in Audition. So the first step in this process is to sweeten the audio. Um, here is all of the audio I recorded over an Audition. So you can see I have different takes here. And I'm going to do this. I'm going to end up exporting this all as one file. But I'm going to go ahead and put little markers here so that when I get this into Premiere, I know where the different takes are. I like to sweeten my audio before it gets into my edit. So I have uh, a preset that I use on everything. So what's going on in this preset? Well, we have a voice denoise. Um, I will show you all the stuff. This is all isotope stuff. So voice denoise first. I like to use this to clean up any background noise, fans, anything like that. Let's listen to what it can do. I'm going to hit loop. I want to find a blank part of my audio and I want to hit learn. This is going to capture a noise print, meaning it's going to capture the background noise of my setup. 
and you can see the noise there. You can see I can adjust the threshold and we're pretty much reducing all the noise at this point. If you reduce the noise too much, you get weird uh, artifacts and it will sound kind of like a bad MP3. So don't do that. The next stage in this is a de-click because I have a tendency to make little click sounds. Let's listen to what just clicks sound like because it's really gross. So yeah, uh, if you want to make weird IDM percussion, you can turn on output clicks only and get weird IDM percussion. The next thing in this chain is Nectar. This is doing all the heavy lifting when it comes to uh, processing my vocal to sound good. So we have a gate. A gate is cleaning up any additional background noise. We have an EQ. We have a de to take care of sibilance. We have another EQ that's doing a bit of sweetening. And uh, we will listen to this in just a second. And we have a compressor doing compression and gain makeup. So let's go ahead and see what level we're at for this and whether or not I need to make any changes. 8S or A138N or directly out of the effects aid, you're gonna get a much hotter signal. And I have to use um, what's called a pad, which is a built-in feature on many audio interfaces to pad the input about. I'm looking to tickle my limiter here a little bit and uh, just want to make sure that everything sounds fine. And it does. It's great. It's wonderful. Uh, we don't need reverb at all. Um, next up is something called breath control. It helps um, with breaths a little bit. Um, you have to be careful with this because it can actually like grab onto things like T's and K's because they have a lot of the same tonal quality as a breath. That's just what it is, what it is. You know, uh, proximity to the microphone is going to give you a different sound um, and uh, you want to be consistent with that. To, uh, but you also placed my just kind of want to do the best you can. So I'm going to export this entire thing as one file and the markers will allow us to cut this up later. So we're going to go into Premiere and um, by the time we're done showing off the color grading workflow, hopefully you'll uh, be able to see the syncing workflow um, with the audio and stuff like that. Uh, hopefully this will be exported and we can move on to that. So just like I have a project template for uh, folders in Windows, I have a project template for my Premiere stuff. So we have a video folder. This is where video is going to go. Let's start ingesting some of that video. Panasonic uh, codec is an MP4, it's compressed, but it ends up looking really good. So it's a lighter file size, which works really, really well, and also um, takes less time to transfer. You can see that you know we got all these clips over and uh, these ProRes clips are gonna take a much longer time. So let's go into sequences. Um, I have what's called a master sync sequence, and this is where everything starts. So this is where I'm gonna sync everything together, and I usually do my color grading in this sequence as well. So I'm going to pull everything in. I'm gonna say change sequence settings to match, and then I'm going to go up to my sequence settings and I'm going to change this to 1920 by 1080. I shoot in 4K, um, but I edit in 1080. And uh, the reason for that is because uh, here's here's about 50% right here. Um, I'll just zoom out a little bit. So this is a 50% uh, size of this clip. I have up to that much zoom now um, without any loss in quality, and I can actually push that a bit more. So it's really nice to be able to shoot in 4K and edit in uh, 1080 so that you have all this extra zoomy zooms that you can mess around with. So let's pick a shot and color grade it real quick. Uh, how about this one? I use Lumetri. Um, I have a little preset set up that does nothing because otherwise if you search for Lumetri in Premiere, it takes forever to find the right thing. So I'm gonna go into basic correction. For this camera, for the Panasonic, I use what's called a LUT. A lookup table is something that applies a range of color correction to a file in order to get it from this flat look, which you can see right now, to something that looks a little more uh, ready to go. So I like to use the low contrast noise or low contrast neutral. So let's flip this on and off and you can see what a difference this makes in terms of the color. This is what flat looks like and uh, you've probably seen the flat look before. This is a really actually common sort of hipster look that people have been working with. Um, you know, not a lot of contrast, not a lot of saturation. Some people just leave their uh, footage looking like this, which uh, was quite a trend once flat became a trend. Now that I have this in here, I can see that, you know, there's some work I wanna do. I wanna grab white balance off the keys and see if that's good for me. Uh, you can grab a little dropper here and grab a white balance. Oh, now I have to remember that I was using a red light. 
you can see the red light there. So there is going to be a bit of a color difference here. Um, if I try to pull a white balance from something, it may have a red cast to it. So I have to be careful with that. So at this point, I could hit auto and see uh, what Premiere does in Lumetri. Um, but uh, generally, I find it to make it a little too bright. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this exposure, put it back down to around one. And uh, I'm going to start playing around with these main sliders here and the creative sliders to uh, play around with vibrance and sharpening to get a look that I want. So uh, generally, I like a semi-low contrast look. Um, I like more saturation. I like my stuff to look bright and colorful, but I don't want it to like like look bad, like like cartoonishly colorful like that. Um, depending on the situation that you're shooting in, um, if you have something that's like the background that's low saturation, you can get away with more saturation. Sometimes you have to sort of like wing it a bit. We're actually going to leave this right around here. And what I'd like to do is uh, sort of shore up the darkness over here with the well exposed over here. So I'm going to pull the shadows up just a little bit. Now you can see the difference here between that. Just a little bit more. I could also pull the contrast down and get back to something that has a little less contrast, but I think that right there looks pretty good for what I'm trying to do. I'm going to add a little bit of sharpening and we're good to go. So let's go ahead and try this on some other clips, okay? Let's try it on here. Okay, I'm going to need to do more work on that one. Let's try it here. Pretty good. Pretty good. So once I have a uh, color that uh, a color grade that I'm okay with, what I do is I go into my uh, project and I paste it onto these clips. And what that does is it turns it into a master clip effect. And I'll show you what that means. When I put an effect on a clip and I go into my effects controls, it shows up right here in the effects. And uh, each clip can have any number of effects in here. So if I make a cut here, both of these clips now have a different version with the same settings of this Lumetri color effect. So if I decided I wanted to make a universal change to the color of a clip, I would then have to go through each clip that had that version of Lumetri on it and, um, and, and change it. And that's no good. So I like to use um, master clip effects. So I go to project, I hit paste, and now the Lumetri effect is in this as a master clip effect, which you can get to by going to effects controls, clip, and then source. So this is now basically intrinsic to the clip. It is, uh, no matter what I do to this clip, um, it will have that master clip effect on it. And I can make a series of cuts here. And if I go into the master clip effect and change something like that, it applies to every single cut, which is really, 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 really useful. So that's my color grading sort of workflow. Let's go ahead and, and fix this one clip. I'm going to have to make a cut. And because this is all one take, because I was an idiot, I'm going to have to make another version of Lumetri to go on top of that, just to make an extra, an extra change. This is just a badly exposed shot. You know, what are you going to do? Let's see. Let's go ahead and bring up the shadows a bit. Wonderful. I think that's great. I think that'll work just fine for what we're trying to do. So that's my color grading. Uh, that's my color grading technique. Uh, let me show you the sync technique. Here is the audio. So let's take a look at this file real quick. You can see that we have these markers here. These markers are my takes, my different clips that I'm going to have to be working with. Each one of these was a stop and start of the camera. So we have a couple options here. I can right click on this and hit synchronize. So I have my audio and my video selected. Let's see if this works. Synchronize. If we're lucky, it will. And it will automatically move the audio to where the video should be. This is the advantage of having audio in your camera to match your studio audio. One thing I will note that uh, I found, there's this thing that happens where um, at 23.976, which is what I'm shooting at, um, the frame rate, uh, I do find that the video likes to be about two frames before the audio in order to look like it's perfectly synced, um, especially when it comes to music and stuff like that. Something about the way that the eye and the ear uh, process information. So we can go through and synchronize all these clips. Wonderful. If you can't synchronize, and maybe we'll run into a clip where you can't, you can easily match these up by listening and using your eyes, which is why the clap is so important. Let's go ahead and go in here and look at a clap. If I had to make these synchronized without synchronize, I would look here and I would go like this. Chop, chop, chop. 
and that sounds perfectly fine. You can hear a slight echo if they're not synced properly, like that. So really, really easy when you do the, the clicker sort of method, the clappy method, both for Premiere and for your ear eyes, if you need to use those. Synchronize even picked up that uh, there were little pieces of stuff here that uh, went somewhere in the process, you know, which is really, really great. And I think that's probably because I clapped at the beginning of each one too, and then there was distinctive audio for each thing. All right, so here's our first shot here. Oh, look, I'm beautiful. So I'm gonna right click and say, set to frame size. There I am sitting in a little room. Ooh, look at that rave we're having. I'm gonna manually sync this to the uh, beginning of here because I don't wanna mess up any of my stuff. Dog, Dog is here. here. Wonderful. So let's get this color graded. This is shot in ProRes also in like S-Log, which is another word for flat. I'm gonna grab the Lumetri. I'm not gonna use a LUT on this one. I'm just gonna hit basic correction. I'm going to hit auto. It's gonna blow out the shot. I'm gonna take it back a bit, something like that, so it looks a bit more natural. Give ourselves some saturation before, I don't want my face to look orange. Very warm in here, and that's uh, because I used the red light, which was probably a bad idea. That's much better, that's much more natural. I like that quite a bit more. I'm gonna make some slight adjustments here, a little bit more saturation now that everything's not crazy red. And I'm gonna go down to my creative and add a little bit of vibrance and a little bit of sharpening. And I think that looks pretty good, though my face is a bit orange. So what can I do about that? Well, let's dig into some advanced color grading stuff. So if we go down to what's called HSL secondary, I can set a color, which would be my face. I can add another color to the other side. And you can see these sliders now create a mask. That's my face. Do, do, do. Just pick what you wanna change and uh, be the change you want to see in the world. I'm going to adjust these sliders here to grab just my face and my skin. And you can see we, the, the wood um, is getting picked up as well because wood and the, the pine wood and uh, my face and my skin are pretty much the same color. And that's okay. I don't mind pulling down the saturation from all that stuff. So I'm going to denoise this just a little bit so it's not quite so splotchy and I'm gonna blur it just a little bit, and then I'm going to turn down the saturation of it. So watch what happens. See how I can just pull saturation directly out of my face, something like that. Let's AB this so you can see what it looks like. Before, after, before, after. A little bit more natural on my face there. I like it. Let's pretend I had everything synced here and everything was ready to edit. I can take this master sync, copy it, and paste it, into my current sequence, and I will change this to main edit. And then, Bob's your uncle, I'm ready to edit. So here I would mute natural audio, bring this up, and I'd start editing. So you'll see the final edit of this, obviously. Um, I export directly from Premiere, unless I'm uh, in introducing After Effects. Um, and that's pretty much it, friends. That's how I shoot and edit videos. Um, hopefully this was informative. Hopefully this was something that you can bring uh, into your own process in some way or another. I'll have links, extensive links, in the uh, in the video description to pretty much everything I mentioned. Ugh, I didn't get that shot in focus. That sucks. Thanks very much for watching. My name is Jeremy. This is Red Means Recording, and I hope you have a wonderful day.